Good morning, everyone. If I get an applause for just saying good morning, it's good. that's a good start to the day. I'll take it. Good morning, and welcome to the 19th annual Fannie and Charles Pennikoff Research Symposium. My name is Sean Gallagher, and for the next two hours, I will serve as the chairman of the Board of Trustees of the National MS Society Greater Illinois Chapter. The mission of the National MS Society is to mobilize people and resources for a cure and to address the challenges of everyone affected by MS. We have a full program today, including our annual meeting and volunteer award recognition ceremony. This morning, you will hear from our keynote speaker, Dr. Barry Arneson of the University of Chicago and the National MS Society's 2014 John Distel Prize recipient for MS research. Following Dr. Arneson's address, you will be joined by a panel of our noted neurologists to answer any of your questions. We have an informative program in store for you, and I would like to acknowledge the Fannie and Charles Pennikoff Trust and our many other supporters for helping to make this event possible. That includes our supporting sp sponsor, Genzyme, and our expo sponsors, Biogen and Novartis. It is a very exciting time for MS research, not only in the United States, but across the globe. Over the course of the past year, the National MS Society has invested more than $50 million to support more than 380 new and ongoing research projects around the world, including 30 here in the state of Illinois. I'd now like to turn over uh, the stage to Amy Perrin-Ross to introduce our keynote speaker. Amy is currently the chair of the Greater Illinois Chapters Clinical Advisory Committee, is coordinator of the MS program at Loyola, Loyola Medical Center, and she is a 2012 inductee to the Health Professionals Hall of Fame. Amy? Thank you so much, Sean, for the introduction, and, and I would like to extend my welcome to all of you here today. I'm so pleased to see so many folks who are so passionately interested in MS, whether you are a person who's living with the disease, a care partner, a friend, a loved one, a healthcare professional, welcome. Uh, it's my pleasure again to be here this morning to introduce the rest of today's program and in just a few minutes I'll be introducing our keynote speaker Dr. Barry Arneson. And Dr. Arneson is going to address how far we've come and where we're going in MS research. Now immediately following this uh, presentation there will be an opportunity to ask your questions of a panel of neurology experts who will join us up here at the table. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to ask that you take time throughout Dr. Arneson's presentation or even right now if there's a question that you have that you would like addressed to the panel and write those questions down on index cards. At the end of Dr. Arneson's presentation, the volunteers for the National MS Society will be coming around and picking up those cards and they'll be bringing them up here to me. Then the most difficult job I have today is to sort through often what turns out to be hundreds of cards to try to address as many questions as we can to our panel. Now without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Barry Arneson. Dr. Arneson is the James Nelson and Anna Louise Raymond Professor of Neurology at the University of Chicago. Dr. Arneson has been a leader in the field of MS for more than half a century, and he is an internationally recognized researcher in multiple sclerosis, in patient care, and as well in the education and training of scores of MS researchers and clinicians. I remember when I initially got started in MS and had my interest peaked, Dr. Arneson was certainly one of my mentors. 
He's the founding father of neuroimmunology and has advanced the field by increasing our understanding of basic T cell makeup and functioning, as well as initiating the development of immune modulating therapies in multiple sclerosis. Dr. Arneson led the way in developing the first disease modifying therapy in MS as an early advocate for using interferon beta as a therapy and certainly as a key leader in clinical research trials. He's the author of more than 400 scientific papers that focus on both autoimmunity as well as neurological diseases. Dr. Arneson is the National Multiple Sclerosis Society's 2014 recipient of the prestigious John Distel Prize for MS Research. And as a, a note and a testament to Dr. Arneson and his continued interest and expertise, his undying efforts, right before he was presented with that prize, rather than focusing on all of his experience over the years and what he has done, his comments were, oh my gosh, I've got to get back into the lab and get more work done. There's plenty more research to be done. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Barry Arneson. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Who said no? Okay. And um, I was asked to talk about uh, where we came from, where we are, and where we're going in 45 minutes. So uh, we'll give about 15 minutes each, perhaps. And, but what I want to start out with is, um, whoops, a day. Uh, what the talk is going to end up being about, and that is about a molecule called immunoglobulin-like transcript 3. Everyone's got that for the quiz at the end, right? Okay. We'll call it ILT3. And uh, people with MS have attacks, as we know, and they also have remissions. And they say, thank God I'm in remission because nothing's going on. But it turns out that remission is as active in terms of the immune system as attacks. It is just active in a different way. And so that one can take advantage, perhaps, of that activity and manipulate it to make MS do better than it does currently. And this particular molecule has two sides to it, an outside and an inside. And the outside has those two loops that you can see on the slide. And those two loops bind to a receptor on activated T cells and turn them off. And it has another receptor inside the cell, which is those three blue uh, things in the middle there. And that signals back into the cell to tell it to stop making bad molecules uh, that uh, affect uh, the immune system and cause damage. And this particular molecule is particularly active, and I mean active, when MS is inactive. And it is inactive when MS is active. And so it's important to uh, try and manipulate this, and that's what we'll end up talking about. But first, they sort of asked me to review a little bit of what's been going on for beforehand. And MS patients complain about the slow pace of progress. So we are going to put the slow pace of progress into some kind of perspective here. And I want to begin by, with a personal anecdote. And that's the following. And that is, uh, two months ago, my granddaughter, age four, was playing out on the lawn and behind her house when suddenly a skunk charged out of the bushes, jumped on her, and bit her. She bit the skunk back, uh, and, uh, and uh, her mother uh, bashed the skunk and chased it away a bit. And, uh, but uh, this is aberrant behavior, skunk-wise, and uh, raises a concern about whether that skunk might have rabies. And rabies can be transmitted by animal bites, and rabies is a universally fatal illness in man, 
So the cops were called, go find the skunk. And uh, they did. They found it a, a half mile away, an hour or so later, shot it. And we were able to get uh, autopsy on the skunk and show that the brain, in fact, was infected with rabies. So my granddaughter had to receive rabies vaccine. And uh, so I thought I might talk a little bit about rabies vaccine. What does rabies vaccine have to do with MS? I'll show you. So in 1885, Joseph Meister, nine-year-old boy, was bitten 14 times by a rabid dog. His mother put him on a train, or she got on a train with him, and uh, went to Paris and presented herself to Louis Pasteur the next day and said, what are you going to do about this? Now it turned out that Louis Pasteur had been trying to develop a vaccine for dogs, because dogs transmit rabies, and what he was doing was he was taking spinal cords out of rabbits that had been infected with the rabies virus, and he hung them around the lab to dry out. And uh, nobody knew what viruses were in those days, but what they knew was that this was transmissible and that there was some kind of transmissible principle in the spinal cord, and that if they dried it out, that the, uh, that the spinal cord principle was no longer infectious. So he took the driest cord he had hanging in the lab and ground it up and injected it into Meister. And, uh, and uh, he followed with other spinal cords day after day, eventually getting back to some that weren't quite so dried out. And uh, this is a picture of Louis Pasteur and that boy. And they would put all the injections, 10 of them, around the abdomen in a ring. And uh, the last one, they also injected it into a rabbit, and the rabbit died of rabies. So uh, Meister was clearly protected by this vaccine. And uh, within a few years, it had been improved so that you, you raised it in sheep brains and treated it with phenol. Uh, but one of the complications that occurred in two to 5% of the patients who got this was a neurologic illness called a neuroparalytic accident. And the neuroparalytic accidents uh, were unclear as to cause. Maybe the rabies virus was only half dead. What was it? But subsequently, it was possible to raise, a, raise the virus in fibroblast cells, which are not nervous tissue. And when that vaccine came along, it, it turned out that there were no more neuroparalytic accidents so that what that said was that it was something in the spinal cord tissue itself or the brain tissue itself that was responsible for these neurologic symptoms that came on uh, in uh, patients getting this vaccine, first point. Secondly, when they got it, the areas where the vaccine had been injected lit up so that there was some sort of reaction against the nervous tissue. Third point, only some people got it so there was some kind of selective vulnerability, which would either have to be genetic or environmental. And we'll talk a little bit about those kind of problems in MS. So what they would get was uh, uh, weakness, numbness, tingling, uh, problems with coordination, visual disturbances, and so on, all the kind of symptoms that one sees in multiple sclerosis and no one knew what was going on. And so, we move forward. And in 1933, five decades after Pasteur's vaccine was introduced, an experiment was conducted in monkeys in which they received multiple injections of brain tissue over weeks or months and came down with a paralytic disease that was clearly a demyelinating and, uh, and um, inflammatory illness. And this, of course, was the genesis of experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis, as we call it EAE, which is the animal model used to this day to study MS. Another uh, five years went by, and the initial experiment was confirmed. Oh, it really was true. Another 10 years went by, 
And it was discovered that if you added tubercle bacilli to the brain tissue that you could bring the animals down with an illness within 10 days to two weeks. And that revolutionized uh, the study of EAE because it was possible to do it in small animals and collect large numbers of them in, in, in a relatively short time. Another five years went by and it was a, possible to show that with ACTH one could lessen the severity of it, that is to say it was potentially treatable. I looked up EAE in 2014 on PubMed. There are 7,520 papers listed, and that was, listing started in 1975, so it's totally incomplete. I looked up the last five years, and there were only 2,310 papers in the last five years, over 1,800 and some odd days, which works out to somewhat more than one paper a day rather than one every 50 years. And uh, I have to confess that I have not read them all. <clears throat> so clearly, looking back on it, the neuroparalytic accidents of rabies were in fact EAE and a model for MS itself. Now in not July 1959, oh, everyone's doing their arithmetic here, okay. Uh, I became a fellow of the National Multiple Sclerosis Society. In fact, the fellow of the Multiple Sclerosis Society. I was the only one at the time. And uh, they had made such a big deal of it that they presented me with the fellowship, or the people who presented me with the fellowship were Richard Nixon and Shirley Temple, the dynamic duo, shall we call them. And uh, I started to study immunology with Byron Waxman, who was an immunologist by training. He had developed an anti-lymphocyte antibody, and we gave that to animals, and they were somewhat protected from EAE, so that it looked as though lymphocytes might have something to do with EAE. And it occurred to me that there was this big bag of lymphocytes in the thymus gland in um, newborn animals, and I decided to try and take out the thymus gland of newborn animals and see what happened when they grew up. And um, at that point in time, the thymus had no known function. It was viewed as an evolutionary error and uh, thought to be useless. In fact, babies were, had their thymuses irradiated if they had trouble breathing to make more space. And uh, so I t wanted to take out the thymus of newborn rats. Now, newborn rats are kind of small. They're about the size of your thumbnail, a little bigger maybe. And, um, and they wiggle, and they wiggle incessantly. And it's very difficult to put a tracheal tube down some, an animal that is uh, half an inch long. And um, so we had to figure out how to do this, and what we ended up doing was putting them in a plastic tube and putting the plastic tube in ice water and lowering their body temperatures. And with that hypothermia, they became unconscious, they stopped moving, and the, and the heart rate slowed. Uh, rather substantially, and um, and so the heart would beat about once once a, a mi once a minute. Now you can't use very sharp things with a little squiggly thing that's kind of very soft. So we used to dissect out the thymus with uh, toothpicks, and then put the put the uh, animal under a heat lamp until it warmed up and wiggled again. And then once it had wiggled, uh, we would give it back to its mother. And it became important to use mothers who had had prior litters. Surprise. Rat mothers who have had prior litters are more relaxed than rat mothers that have not had prior litters. And they're more likely to accept the babies when you give them back to them. The rats grew up, grew up. They seemed healthy enough, even though they were in an environment that was not by any means clean, which meant that there was something, as we'll see in a minute, beyond uh, the lymphocytes involved in the immune response. And uh, this is a rat mother, a relaxed one, uh, presenting a, what, a toy to one of her pups. And uh, what we did was when they grew up, we immunized them with nervous tissue and tubercle bacilli and uh, studied them in terms of the animal model for MS EAE. And the animals who didn't have a thymus were protected against EAE, and uh, when we looked in the spleens of those animals, what we could see was that uh, 
Instead of the normal circumstance, which is on the left, where there are small lymphocytes that stain dark, uh, there were no small lymphocytes, and uh, that the absence of small lymphocytes was responsible for the protection from EAE. And so we were able to conclude that the thymus and the small lymphocyte are among the few remaining constituents of the organism for which no well-defined function has been recognized. We now assign to this organ and the cell it produces a role of major importance in the body's economy. The thymus and the small lymphocyte are essential to the normal expression of one large class of immune responses, delayed or cellular hypersensitivity, and perhaps for certain types of antibody formation as well. I think that uh, the EMS got value for money in terms of the fellowship they provided to me. And of course, it, we called these cells small lymphocytes, but they came to be called T cells because they matured in the thymus. Since T cells were critical for EAE, since EAE had many features similar to MS, the role of T cells in MS became a subject of considerable study and has been a major focus of function ever since. In fact, all of the approved disease-modifying therapies that we have at hand at the moment are all directed against T cells. But the ILT3 that I began with is not a product of the T cell. It is a product of the monocyte. And, uh, and uh, as I see it also in progressive MS, the T cell is not the major cause of progression in MS, but the a cell akin to the monocyte, a cousin of the monocyte called the microglial cell is very much involved in progressive MS. One of the other things that became clear as the things evolved over the years, or again, over the decades, uh, was that there were subtypes of T cells and that those different subtypes interacted with one another and also interacted with other types of cells such as monocytes. And uh, that is to some extent illustrated here. The, the, the monocyte derives, interestingly enough, from a, a cell that originates in the yolk sac, which is attached to the embryo, but not actually part of the embryo. And uh, they, in the, on the tenth day of, of embryonic life in mice, for example, these cells leave the yolk sac and migrate into the liver. They subsequently migrate into the bone marrow and ultimately some of them as mature monocytes end up in the blood. Interestingly, there's a second population that originates two days before the monocyte population, and that is the population that moved from the yolk sac into the beginnings of the brain, and those cells are called microglia, and they are cousins of monocytes, and almost everything that I'm going to tell you about monocytes in this today applies to them as well, but they are restricted to the brain. And as we'll show you, relatively important in progressive MS. Now, the other thing there is that if those cells in embryonic life arise earlier in embryonic life than the monocyte, they do so because they are pretty darn important in some way or another, and it's very clear that they are. They're very much involved in the shaping and formation of the brain and also in the protection of the brain, as we'll see. Now, the T cells are also divided into subsets, and their first division is new into a subset called CD4 cells, and the second subset is CD8 cells, and two-thirds of T cells carry CD4 and one-third CD8, and that will become important a little later on then there are all these other subtypes, but we're going to restrict ourselves to two of them today, the Th1 cell on the upper part and the Ts cell or T suppressor cell in the lower part. Now it turns out that the T suppressor cell acts on the monocyte to direct the monocyte to turn the Th1 cell, which is responsible for tissue damage in MS, off. So these three interact in ways that are very germane to MS. How and why do MS attacks start? And it turns out, and this is an example, that in, uh, the, there is a drainage of spinal fluid, cerebrospinal fluid, uh, 
from the brain through the roof of the, of, 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 through the, where then, where then, no, where the olfactory nerves are into channels that go to lymph nodes deep in the cervical region, the deep cervical lymph nodes. And that when people have MS attacks, there's a certain amount of tissue damage that's damaged by, during the uh, illness or the attack makes its way down those channels into those deep cervical lymph nodes so that there is myelin and myel myelin components in the deep cervical lymph nodes. And that's illustrated here. And these are MS patients in remission. And they have myelin proteins in, the, in the, uh, their lymph nodes and nothing seems to be happening. So they're in remission, the stuff is there, nothing seems to be happening, but in fact something is happening as we'll try and show you. And then what happens is that if someone gets an upper respiratory viral infection, that the viral infection precipitates an attack of MS. In fact, the frequency of MS attacks is about five-fold increased in a week or two after an upper respiratory viral infection than at other times. And the balance between remission and an attack shifts very abruptly from remission mode to attack mode. Now, it's obvious that the attack mode is an active process and that the remission is as well, and that there is a yin-yang or balance between remission and attack. In progressive MS, attacks become very infrequent and ultimately cease altogether at the same time as there is a progression worsening in disability, at least for walking, which is the usual thing that's measured. And that, because there is that shift, and because if one knocks T cells down to levels, level C in AIDS, for example, that uh, the progression still occurs that the role of T cells in progressive MS is very different than the role of T cells in relapsing or remitting MS, so that there is a fundamental difference in what's going on between progressive MS and relapsing or remitting MS, and that has to affect our thinking in terms of what we're trying to do. Okay, so we've already told you this, and this is showing the uh, the virus and the viral components moving from the sinus infection into the deep cervical lymph node and shifting the balance. And also coming along are some um, tissue damaging and exciting molecules that are made by monocytes in the nasal mucosa itself and carried in along with the, with the viral components. So what happens is that when you get a second immune response that, that stirs things up, that there is a spillover into the MS components or the, or the, the myelin components in the lymph node that leads to uh, the generation of an immune response against those components and an attack of MS. I want to say a little something about genetics of MS. I said in rabies that only a proportion of people got it, and that's true of MS as well, and therefore there has to be something else going on than just, um, uh, and, and one of those things is genetics. There are about 100 genes involved in susceptibility to MS, but there really only are three or four that amount to much. And we're going to restrict ourselves to the two that I think amount to the most. Now, those monocytes are phagocytic cells. That is, they eat things, and they eat bacteria, and they get infected with viruses, and they, uh, and they pick up proteins as well, like the proteins of myelin. And when you get those proteins uh, in the inside themselves, they digest them, they chip away at them into smaller fragments, and then those smaller fragments are inserted into molecules called HLA molecules that then, and they have a cleft in the, in the surface of them, and so the, a little piece of protein gets st stuck there and shifted out to the surface where it's looking, where the T cell can find it and respond to it. And the T cell can respond to it in two ways. One, turned on. Two, turned off. And most of the time they respond by being turned off. So when I say there's nothing going on in that lymph node, there actually is quite a bit going on in the lymph node, because, but because it's turned off, it's not apparent to people. And, um, and um, the important point here is that, uh, that 
there are certain molecules, certain forms of those HLA molecules that predispose to MS. And, uh, and the HLA molecules are divided into class one, class two. Class one molecules are two major sites of that. Class two molecules are two major sites of that. And, um, and it turns out that one of the sites at, at the DR site, that a particular subtype at that, at that site, DR2, is associated with a fourfold increased risk for MS. Now, that doesn't mean everybody with MS has this particular molecule, but that if you have that molecule, you're more likely to get MS. And, if you, and everybody gets two copies, because you get one from each parent. And so if you have two copies of DR2, the risk for MS is eightfold increased over that of the population at large. But this is counterbalanced by uh, another molecule on the other class, called HLA-A2, that decreases the risk for MS twofold. And if you get two copies of that, it decreases the risk fourfold. And what that says is that since DR2 is expressed on CD4 cells, the first class we mentioned of, C of T cells, that's, that T that's CD4 positive T cells, and in fact the subtype Th1 cells, are the ones that do the damage in MS, and that the, uh, and that the CD8 cells have a protective role, or can have a protective role in MS, and that the balance between those is part of the balance between attacks and remission. Okay, now this is a simple diagram <coughs> of, of what I've just been talking about. But on the, on the uh, left-hand side is a CD8 suppressor cell, and the HLA2 is presenting a peptide to the T-cell receptor that responds to that peptide, and that CD8 cell is using a molecule called CTLA4. You don't need to remember these numbers and names and so on. But that molecule is turning off the, turning off the monocyte against activating the aggressive T-cells. So this is a tolerance-inducing signal, and, and that's transmitted through into the monocyte by another molecule called CD80, an anti-stimulatory. On the other side is the CD4-TH1 cell, which is causing damage. It's being presented its antigen by the DR2. The T, its T-cell receptor for that, that antigen is responding, and it's using a, an inflammatory, exciting molecule called CD28, to activate CD86 on the monocyte, and that then turns the monocyte on. So there's a yin-yang between these two contending for forms of, of immune response. Also shown are two proteins, one virus protein, the other myelin protein. What we've illustrated here is that the virus protein is, is going in both directions, but it could have been one virus, virus protein one direction, myelin protein in the other, and so on. And this is just to point out that green is the protective one, red is the causing one, and if you have two copies of the green and no copies of the red, as opposed to two copies of the red and no copies of the green, there's a huge difference in relative risk for MS. Okay, that's genetics. Obviously important in MS, but if you look at identical twins, they have the same genes. And uh, if one of them has MS, the chances that the other one will have, get MS are 25%. So it's much higher, for sure, than the population at large. But at the same time, three quarters of them don't get MS. And what that says is that there has to be more involved than, than, than just uh, genes, and that something in the environment is very much involved in MS. And maybe not just something, maybe many things. But I think most of us, well, not most of us, I believe <laughs> uh, that, the, that the most environmental factor is likely to be a virus that in parts of the world where MS is uncommon uh, is acquired in early life. And in parts of the world where MS is commoner, such as here, is acquired in later life, teenage or early adult, early adult years, because MS is, of course, itself a disease of early adult years much of the time. And uh, it turns out that the virus of uh, infectious mononucleosis, 
which is called the Epstein-Barr virus, fits the bill here. And for example, MS is quite rare in India, and 95% uh, of the population in India has picked up that virus by age five, usually without any symptoms whatsoever. Whereas uh, here, of course, it's usually picked up in teen or early adult years. And yet, um, if you look at children who have been raised here, and they're children of parents who were from India, the children who are raised here have a very substantial risk for MS, which is much higher than the risk that their parents had. And <clears throat> their genes are their parents' genes. So it's, the genes didn't change, the environment changed, and the susceptibility to MS changed. And that has some potential implications too. Because it turns out that everybody with MS tests positive for the antibody to infectious mononucleosis at diagnosis. And uh, that uh, in this country, only 5% or so of people have an actual history of having had mono, even though 95% of people test positive eventually for the, for the virus that causes mono. So most of the time, even here, it's asymptomatic. If you look at MS patients, however, and I've paid some attention to this, about 25% of MS patients give a history of having had mono. So it's a much higher incidence of mono in MS patients than in the population at large, which I think is surely trying to tell us something. And uh, MS is, of course, uncommon in children, quite uncommon, but nonetheless, it happens once in a while. And if you look at children with MS, they're 85% of them positive for Epstein virus, not all of them, but diagnosis of MS in children is somewhat less secure than in adults. And if you match them against other children of like age, they're twice as likely to have uh, antibodies to the Epstein Barr virus as their peers. And so this, sort of, and there's a lot of other evidence too, but there's enough evidence that I presented here to suggest that mono might well be something that sets MS in motion, which then raises some very interesting issues because quite a few people in this audience are interested in the cure. But sometimes an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And perhaps if we had an antibody generated with a vaccine to the Epstein virus given to soft young children, that we might be able to eradicate MS off the face of the earth. It's something to think about. <clears throat> Now, MS patients tell me that they've been under a lot of stress lately and that, and that they think stress makes them worse. And um, there are two possibilities. They're right or they're wrong. And, um, and um, it's really tricky to try and define stress. You know, what, how, what, what kind of number do you give it? You know, uh, what happened last week? Well, the dog got run over, and I caught my son uh, smoking marijuana. Is that a two? You know, it, it's very difficult to, to, to quantitate stress. But one of the things we could say for sure, and that is, without trying to say uh, anything about the quantity of it, that we know where it starts, and it starts up here in the brain. That's for sure. And MS doesn't. MS starts in the lymph nodes, as we just showed you. So <clears throat> if stress makes MS worse, then the brain must talk to the immune system. The immunologists don't like that. They say the immunology is complicated enough already without bringing the brain into it. But the fact is that almost everything is controlled by the brain at one level or another. And if the brain is controlling the immune system, there are two ways it can do so. One is by hormones. And we know that for sure, after all. ACTH from the pituitary turns on steroid production and that sort of thing. And the sec <clears throat> second possibility is hard wiring. And uh, it turns out that the only kind of nerves that go to the lymph nodes, and the spleen for that matter, are what are known as sympathetic nerves. And the sympathetic nerves use 
noradrenaline as their transmitter. So we thought, Ava Shore and I, that uh, maybe it would be interesting to knock out the sympathetic nerves and create a stress-free mouse that was unable to get its adrenaline up. So this is known as the serene mouse. And the serene mouse cannot get its adrenaline up because it has no sympathetic nerves. It's a very brainy mouse. It's a very happy mouse because it's, it's uh, stress-free. And one of the things that's interesting is that the sympathetic nerves innervate some, innervate some muscles in the eyes, so it has droopy eyelids, which are illustrated here. But other than the droopy eyelids, it looks pretty healthy. And then we decided to see what would happen if we gave it EAE by immunizing it with nervous tissue. And uh, animals like the serene mouse, without a proper sympathetic nervous system, develop very severe EAE. And oftentimes it even becomes progressive. And uh, it turns out that monocytes have a major role in this worsening of EAE in sympathectomized animals, and that the monocytes of sympathectomized animals are turned on all of the time. And they're making four times as much as the bad stuff as most other, uh, as, as they would ordinarily. And that the receptors for the adrenaline, or noradrenaline, on the immune system cells are a particular type of receptor. There are four different receptors for noradrenaline called alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, beta-2, blah, blah, blah. But, but the beta-2 receptor is the one that's found in the immune system cells, especially on monocytes. And uh, there are drugs that will bind to that receptor and turn it on. They're used to treat asthma. So we treated our mice with the, treated mice with those drugs, and we made EAE better. The point here being that that a neurotransmitter from the nervous system exerts a down regulatory remission promoting effect on the immune system, and that maybe just a little bit of stress is good for you rather than bad for you. Now, here is a study in which we're looking at patients with MS rather than mice uh, with uh, EAE. And this is a study done by Sami Okuri and her colleagues uh, in Boston. And what they did was they added albuterol, which is used to treat asthma and is a beta-2 adrenergic drug to glutarum acetate, better known as Copaxone. And there were about 25 patients in each group. And in the first six months or so, the uh, frequency of relapses was about the same in the albuterol treated as in the placebo treated, but then it split out. And the uh, uh, ones on placebo continued to have frequent attacks, and the ones on albuterol didn't. And when they did their numbers, it turned out that the ones on glutarum acetate had an attack about once every three years, and the ones on albuterol had an attack once every 11 years. Now, it's a small study. It's not, it, uh, it's, it wouldn't satisfy FDA criteria and that sort of thing. But what it's hinting at, and I think even more than hinting at, strongly suggesting, is that this class of drugs might have a potential beneficial effect in MS as an add-on to the drugs we already have. And we'll talk a little more about add-ons in a bit. Now, I said already that HLA-A2 on the CD8 cell is protective in MS. And we knew that a long time ago. And so we started thinking, well, how could it be protective? And, it, and uh, we thought that probably that it was making uh, some of the cells uh, called C CD8 suppressor cells work better than they would otherwise do. And that prompted us, uh, and, and in particular, Jack Antel and Mike Weinrich, working in the lab at the time, to start looking at CD8 suppressor cells. And what, we, what was found was that uh, CD8 suppressor function is defective just prior to uh, and during MS attacks, recovers as attacks are ending, normal or nearly so in remissions, 
that CD8 suppressor function is grossly defective in progressive MS and persistently subnormal in that population until at least very late stages of the disease. And here are data from the first publication published 35 years ago. <coughs> And uh, what we're looking at is a suppressor cell function and uh, in patients with MS thought to be stable by us clinically at the time, because there were no MRI scans in those days, <clears throat> and those who we took had to have active disease or uh, relapses, and those who were recovering from relapses, and it's pretty clear, isn't it, that, that stable MS looked very much like controls, that active MS looked to have a defective suppressor function and recovering MS uh, show a recovery. So this points to a role, I think, for CD8 suppressor cells in terms of attacks of MS. How the suppressor cells do that was not resolved by these experiments. And what happened was that, uh, that though we worked on these suppressor cells for some, several years, that about 25 years ago, the, uh, several of the senior immunologists, the pundits, the know-it-alls, de decreed that suppressor cells didn't exist, in spite of massive evidence that, of the kind I just showed you. I think the reason was that it just didn't fit immunologic theory of the time. But theory has a way of being confounded by fact. and. Uh, after about 15 years of no suppressor cells. And what happens with that is the funding dries up. The, the committees that are reviewing grants and so on say, there are no suppressor cells. Who is this nerd who is saying that he wants to study suppressor cells? So we had to do it on the sly um, for a while. But beginning about 10 or 15 years ago now, suddenly, oh, well, th there are suppressor cells but they don't dare call them suppressor cells, so they call them regulatory cells. So we now have T-regs, and the S word has still been expunged from the uh, vocabulary of immunologists, but it doesn't change the fact that the cell population exists, has existed all along, and, is, and has a, perhaps, and I think likely, a major role in MS. And here are data generated from our group by uh, Dr. Nerona uh, from the original study with interferon beta 1b, which was the first of the drugs that have been approved for MS. And what was done here was looking at uh, control patients, controls, normal people, patients entered into the trial. And we selected for really active patients here so that uh, they were, half of them were having attacks, half of them weren't. And, and the average was about half of the value for the control population. Over the course of the trial, we looked at, uh, at these patients on placebo, and they didn't budge. We looked at the patients on a low dose of interferon, and there was some restor restoration of function, and the patients on high dose of interferon uh, showed a substantial return of suppressor function. That is to say that, that interferon beta 1b was able to augment suppressor cell function, and uh, unfortunately, this was published in 1994, or it actually was barely published in 1994 because we couldn't get it into any major journal because suppressor cells didn't exist. And, uh, and, and in fact, this data to this day remain largely buried because no one remembers it, no one thinks about it, and so on, but, uh, but nonetheless, it was out there all the time. And it turns out that interferon beta also turns on monocytes and ILT3. So that the way in which it is acting to augment suppressor function is in part at least direct or indirectly mediated through that activation of monocytic cells. Now, uh, as we said at the beginning, and we'll say it over again because sometimes if it's said over again, people start to believe that maybe it matters, and that, and that is that the CD8 suppressor cells contact monocytes directly by a cell surface to cell surface interaction. We showed you that uh, with, between CTLA4 and CD80 to upregulate ILT3. 
that ILT3 then turns down activated CD4 cells and turns off, turns them off, uh, and thus prevents uh, people or lessens the severity or prevents the onset of attack. That it signals back down to the cytoplasm of its own cell to inhibit the ability of that cell to make pro-inflammatory activating molecules that contribute to activation of the T cells. Here, what we are looking at is patients with MS who are in remission and normal healthy people. And we are stimulating them with a dose of glutamic acetate because that causes a little bit of stimulation of T cells. And then we throw in an antibody to ILT3 and we get a big zip up in, uh, in proliferative, proliferative response of those cells. The point is that what we are doing in these patients who are in remission is we are showing that when we prevent ILT3 from inhibiting T cell proliferation, there is a huge increase in T cell proliferation. That is to say that ILT3 is exerting a major restraining influence on the immune system when patients are in remission. And that's an important point here. <clears throat> here we're looking at how much ILT3 is expressed. And we're looking at patients having an attack and 30% of the monocytes are positive for ILT3, but the amount of ILT3 that they express is reduced compared to patients who are stable, patients on interferon beta, healthy controls, and so on, so that there is a fourfold difference in ILT3 expression between relapses and remission. And so this, I think, sort of reinforces the point of the making that, that when ILT3 is up, MS is down. Okay, what are we gonna do about this? First thing is that there are drugs that will make interferon beta work better in this circumstance, and this is true of other, other, the other drugs that, that are used to treat AMS, and one of those, believe it or not, is vitamin B12, and the second one is Accutane, or the retinoids, and both of those uh, potentiate the ability of interferon beta to augment ILT3 function and augment T CD8 suppressor cell function as well. And these are data from our shop looking at, 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 uh, at uh, uh, retinoic acid, which is uh, equivalent to Accutane. And uh, the retinoic acid alone isn't doing anything to suppress our function, but when we add it to the interferon beta, we get an augmentation of the effect of interferon beta with the retinoic acid. So that drugs that by themselves don't do anything may potentiate the ability of drugs that we do use to treat MS to function. And that's an important principle that I don't think we pay very much attention to in terms of what we're looking at in terms of patients at this point in time. Because patients in this room, lots of them, are on lots of other drugs in addition to the immune monitory drugs that many of, many of you are on. And we don't think about it too much in terms of are there drugs that will make this work better? And for that matter, are there drugs that do the opposite? And uh, especially you have to be a little concerned about those bottles with Chinese writing on them uh, where you don't know what's in it and say, you know, it may not do me any good, but it can't do me any harm. Yes, it can. And, and it's something you have to be a bit concerned about. Okay, here we're looking at albuterol, used to treat asthma, beta true adrenergic drug, acts on that receptor, in on adrenaline receptor in lymphocytes and in monocytes, and here we're looking at it at a monocytic cell line, and when we add albuterol, we get a big augmentation in, in ILT3. That is to say we can augment ILT3 with a very simple drug. This is a simplified version of what I've been talking about. <laughs> okay, up in the left, upper left, 
is a picture of ILT3, which you saw at the very beginning with those two loops and the, th and the three inhibitory motifs inside the thumb. And that uh, ILT3 is being bound by a receptor on the CD4 cell, and that is turning off the CD4 cell. At the same time, the, the, blue, the blue discs are sending a signal to a transcription factor called NF-kappa B to turn off the production of TNF and IL-1 beta, which are bad molecules. You can turn on the, IL, the, the ILT3 with signals from the CD8 suppressor cell, which are shown coming at it from the right-hand side, and by drugs like an albuterol that bypass the CD8 cell and come at it directly. So that there are several things that we can think about here in terms of making that ILT3 system work better. At the bottom, we're looking at MR and GR. And MR stands for mineralocorticoid receptor and GI for glucocorticoid receptor. And prednisone binds to both of those. And we all know that when a prednisone binds to the GR receptor, that that has effects in MS and it's used to treat MS attacks and so on. But not everybody in this audience knows that there is an MR receptor in monocytes, and that the MR receptor works in the opposite way, and that there is a yin-yang with prednisone, just as there is a yin-yang in many of the other things involving the immune system. And that has some potential implications, because what that suggests is that if we had a blocker for the mineralocorticoid receptor, we might be able to make steroids work better than they do, and that might have unforeseen consequences. And there are such blockers. They cross the blood-brain barrier. And our group is working at trying to get a trial underway to look at that aspect of things. I'm going to skip that. OK, so progressive MS, to finish on this point. And in progressive MS, there is a activation of those microglial cells that we talked about earlier that are a cousin of the monocytes. And they are activated throughout the nervous system, everywhere. Which means that whatever signals they're getting or not getting that makes them angry is being delivered throughout the entire nervous system. In relapsing renting MS, there's an attack here, an attack there, or attack somewhere else, but it's not a global thing. So that global activation says, I think, that there must be signals that are likewise global, and they're expressed throughout the entire central nervous system. And it turns out that there are several neurotransmitters, signals, signaling systems used between neurons that are expressed throughout the nervous system and originate in signal nuclei at the back part of the brain in the brainstem. And one of those is the locus ceruleus. Got that? Locus ceruleus. Ceruleus is blue in Latin, so it's a blue spot. OK. And, uh, and the locus ceruleus is the only source of noradrenaline for the nervous system, essentially. So that a single nucleus can, uh, can be involved in providing a signal to microglia throughout the entire central nervous system. And in progressive MS, the amount of noradrenaline in that nucleus is 30% of what it ought to be. So with this major deficiency. And what we've been talking about is drugs that signal through that same receptor that, that, the, that, the, um, that the noradrenaline from the locus ceruleus activates or, or inactivates. So that what I've been talking about with monocytes can easily, I think, be extended, perhaps, but certainly worth testing, to progressive MS and the microglia that are a major factor in that sort of thing. I'm going to skip this. We told you about the locus ceruleus. OK, so in order to get at progressive MS, it seems to me that we pretty much have to look at drugs that cross the blood-brain barrier and, and get into the central nervous system. Most of the drugs that neurologists use do this. After all, we're interested in the nervous system. Most of the drugs used by immunologists don't do this. 
And uh, what that suggests is that there may be new uses for old drugs in people with progressive MS that's never been tested and is certainly worth testing. The neurotransmitter agonists and antagonists, for that matter, are candidates that I've drawn attention to in terms of the beta-2 adrenergic system, but there are several other systems that can just as easily be mixed up here, and there may be several of them acting in concert, in fact, in progressive MS. The hormones that cross the blood-brain barrier are also of interest in MS, and that there are aspects of hormone uh, treatment in MS that we haven't really thought through totally clearly at, at all. And I drew attention to one of those, which is the role of mineralocorticoid receptors. It turns out that, that receptors for glucocorticoids are very ancient. They go back into hagfish and, and even older than that. So they've been around for 500 million years. And interestingly, the oldest one is the mineralocorticoid receptor, not the glucocorticoid receptor. Uh, except there are no, no mineralocorticoids for another 300 million years after the receptor was there. So the real original function of that receptor was not mineralocorticoid at all, but really a yin-yang with the glucocorticoid. Okay, so just what I was trying to say here, when MS in re is in remission, the immune system is not in remission, and that should be part of our therapeutic strategy. That the remission is an active process, and signaling systems such as IL-33, which is the one I've drawn attention to, responsible for <coughs> remission, can be manipulated pharmacologically. It follows that total emphasis on T cells is misplaced, that monocyte lineage cells are clearly implicated in MS, and in particular the microglial cells in the nervous system, that uh, my personal emphasis in terms of treating progressive MS has shifted to drugs that cross the blood-brain barrier and mi mimic the actions of neurotransmitters and hormones, and that progress in the first century, as I think I've shown you, was even slower than it is nowadays. I want to thank the Multiple Sclerosis Society for giving me my start and for their continuing support over the years, the decades. I want to thank my students, fellows, and colleagues for over five decades of fruitful collaboration. There are a lot of them. I want to particularly thank Mark Jensen and Pretty Abraham working in the lab at present for ongoing unpublished studies thus far of ILT3. I want to thank the patients who donated blood samples over and over again over the years and also all of you who taught me about MS, that the patients, mind you. Thank you.